The rocks of the Malvern Hills, formed originally some 700 million years ago, today stand proud of the plains to the east, forming a dramatic ridge, some say almost serpent-like. And since their creation, these hills have had many stories to tell, beginning with the natural forces of plate tectonics and the cauldrons of molten rock that form them. Over subsequent ages, natural weathering has slowly carved and shaped the hills to make them as we see them today. But in more recent times, it's been the activities of mankind that have re-sculpted them. And the best way to see the results of all these spectacular processes is from the air. The nine miles of the Malvern Hills stand so dramatically here because of the rock which makes them. The granite-based rock is very durable and doesn't erode easily. And over the millions of years since its formation, it has resisted the forces of nature that have worn away the rocks to the east and west. The rock of the hills began its life molten and solidified deep within the Earth's crust in an area closer to the South Pole. As the continental plates danced and stretched and split, it eventually ended up where it is. During this time, other geological processes also had an effect, one of which was a shift in the Earth's crust that created a deep fault on the eastern flank of the Malverns. This steep edge is the remnant of one side of a rift valley that over 250 million years has been filled in by softer materials and eroded again to leave the durable Malvern rock standing high. And throughout history, geological movements on the fault have continued and indeed within living memory have been the cause of local earth tremors. Then it was the turn of the last ice age, which brought its glaciers that scoured the lands of Britain as far down as a line between London and Bristol. But this being the last few miles of the glacier's reach, they were unable to dislodge the main rock, and here it remains with the deposits from the ice age all around. This is Gullet Quarry one of the many that once ravaged the Malvern Hills for its rock. A century ago, quarrying was a huge and destructive influence on the hills, but it also exposed some of the geological processes that formed them. A bird's eye view shows us here what is actually a 400 million year old beach, left over from the period when the hills once had a shoreline existence. Then, around 300 million years ago, this beach was pushed up over the old rocks as they were shoved upwards and westwards as the continents collided. When this rock was originally under the ocean, it would have collected its share of animal and plant life that eventually became fossils, and some have been found here in this sedimentary outcrop. The rock that was quarried from the Malvern Hills is hard and old, with many fissures that make it crack easily. This effect was ideal for the growing number of road building projects of the time, as the motor car grew in popularity. This fissuring effect is also the reason that the water emanating from the many springs in the hills is so pure. The rock with its many cracks acts as a massive sponge and because the rock is both durable and insoluble, the water that emerges contains no minerals. This effect has been exploited as bottled water. And the purity of the water was promoted as a medical cure in the numerous water cure establishments that began to make the town of Malvern famous in the 1800s. This is British Camp, the remains of an Iron Age settlement created over 2,000 years ago. 
These ramparts were dug by hand, a Herculean effort. Just the outer rampart would have taken 200 workers around 180 days to dig. We use the word fort to describe British camp, but in fact no one knows the exact purpose of it. It may have been defensive, it may have been a mortuary where the dead were exposed, or perhaps a hilltop settlement. Whatever its purpose, for both the Normans and the Iron Age builders before them, it represented a statement of power over the surrounding plains. This was celebrated by the great English early 20th century composer Sir Edward Elgar. He felt the power of this place and imagined the last of the British chieftains making a final stand against the Romans here 2,000 years ago in his cantata, Caractacus. As we look down from the British Camp Ridge, we see another result of human activity on the landscape. This reservoir was originally created in the 1890s to provide drinking water for the growing towns and villages around the hills. The reservoir is just above Little Malvern Priory, whose tower and terracotta roof mark where one of our foremost medieval poets, William Langland, was educated. Indeed, water has played a part in the poetry of the Malverns. William Langland's vision of Piers Plowman has been in the canon of English poetry since the late 14th century, and it begins on the side of the Malvern Hills, with the dreamer's mind soothed by a babbling brook. And above him, in his dream, he saw a tower. And in Langland's day, this last rampart on British camp may still have housed a fort rebuilt by England's Norman invaders, which quite probably had a tower or bailey on it. And here is another example of the projection of power in the landscape, a couple of miles to the west. This is Eastner Estate. At the centre is a castle, a mock medieval building that was actually built between 1810 and 1824 by John Cox, the first Earl Summers, as a way to impress his contemporaries with the family's growing fortunes. The castle, bosomed high in tufted trees, is surrounded by its arboretum of foreign firs and cedars collected by the various owners of the castle. And beyond is the deer park. The park has always been used for sport, the meaning of which has been reinterpreted throughout the ages. In medieval times, it was for hunting deer, but in the 21st century, the park has been the venue for mountain bike races, runs, bowls, and fishing. And within the park remain many ancient native oaks. Even they have been shaped by human activity, as they were originally harvested for timber. Cutting timber from the trees at above the browsing height of deer allows the tree to regenerate itself and so gives this characteristic shape of pollarded parkland trees, a thick trunk from the ground giving way to fingers of timber at the reach of a man and his axe. These trees are hundreds of years old and have become home to around 250 species of insects. But impressive as these natural monuments are, the park and surrounding countryside is dominated by a single man-made one. This is the obelisk, a 19th century park folly turned into a memorial for the ancestors of the owner's family. Parks are not entirely about grandeur in the landscape. Eastner Park once encompassed a much greater area, which included this, the Giant's Cave, just below British Camp. It's actually a man-made folly, dug at a time when it was fashionable to have paid hermits to live within your park. And this hermit's cave gives a magnificent view from which to contemplate the sublime work of Mother Nature. 
But unknown to the builders at the time, the cave's rock tells another tale. It's formed of pillow lava, blocks of stone that were extruded as molten rock under the sea, cooled quickly and formed into these characteristic blocks. Their geological name, Warren House Formations, points to a less powerful shaper of the landscape. These oblong impressions we can see from the air were once thought to be burial mounds, but they are, in fact, medieval rabbit warrens that were encouraged by landowners at the time to provide a larder of fresh meat. The rabbits kept the grass closely cropped, an effect that sheep continue today. The result is an area of special acid grassland that's all too rare in southern and central England. But confining larger animals with man-made structures needed greater effort. This is the remains of the Shire Ditch, which runs along the ridge of the hills, a medieval boundary between two great landowners that defined their hunting grounds. It was built by the Earl of Gloucester to the east and was in fact a ha-ha that let the Bishop of Hereford's deer to the west jump into the Earl's hunting ground, but not get back. The sense of a medieval landscape is epitomized here at Castle Morton Common on the southeastern side of the Malvern Hills. It still remains a vast open area where graziers who don't own the land have rights to graze their cattle and sheep in what is very much a medieval form of land tenure. At first, this landscape may seem natural, but everywhere you look, it is in fact influenced by man's activities. From these black poplars that have been pollarded as the oak trees of Eastner Park for timber, to these small ant hills, which are indicative of old, unimproved pasture land. The land is actually agriculturally poor. The hard hill rock that gives up no nutrients either to the water from the hills or the soil above it was ground by the glaciers and flowed down over the eastern slopes half a million years ago. But being of little value, it escaped the great acts of privatization of common land in the 1700s, known as the enclosures. It has been left for grazing then for hundreds of years, and the result is this rich mosaic of scrub, trees, and open pasture. It supports wildlife and plants of national importance. And so in these commons, we see the effect of geological processes, agricultural revenues, landscape history, and human evolution coming together. Some say it's reminiscent of the savannah in Africa's Rift Valley, where humans are believed to have first evolved. As we saw, this is indeed a Rift Valley too. It's this distant memory of the origins of mankind that some believe makes these landscapes so attractive to us, so precious and so worth preserving with their traditional ways of management. Many forces have come together over an immense span of time to give a landscape of such great variety in such a small area. These ancient hills, themselves travelers across the globe, have welcomed Iron Age tribes, poets and composers, animals, and people who find relief from the hurried existence of daily life. 